Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. And today I'm going to give you my ideal Mendelssohn symphony cycle. That is the numbered symphonies, because we need to remember that by the time Mendelssohn got around to writing symphony number one, it was really symphony number 13. <laughs> He'd already done 12 string symphonies, which are splendid works, and we're going to talk about them separately, and possibly some of them individually, because they really are that good and that important. But right now we're talking about the canonic five symphonies. And you might think, well, there are only five. It's not like when we did Shostakovich, which had 15, or Sibelius, who had nine, seven plus two controversial ones. You know, Mendelssohn really is five numbered symphonies. And everybody sort of takes them for granted. And some of them are really dumped on and ignored. It's kind of astonishing, actually, for a composer of this quality and this level of achievement that his symphonies aren't given more serious consideration uh, than in the literature. And uh, most people talk about them. It's like, oh, everyone likes the Italian symphony. And some people like the Scottish symphony. And the rest of them don't really matter. Well, I, I, I don't think that's true. I really don't think it's true. And I did think it's true. I have to confess, I've really come around when it comes to the Mendelssohn symphonies. It's very easy to take Mendelssohn for granted because he's rather easy to listen to and because of his reputation as a sort of, you know, Victorian pretty boy of music, which is so, so wrong. <laughs> I mean, when you get right down to it, it's just so totally wrong. I mean, yeah, he was friends with Queen Victoria. Yeah, you don't hold that against him. But, you know, what, what happened really was that I decided you know, I'd heard Mendelssohn. I knew some of it was great, some of it wasn't. I knew there was tons that I didn't know. And I think I mentioned this a bit when I was giving my talk on on sort of the general listening to Mendelssohn, the big Hensler Classics Mendelssohn Cube. You know, I, I really had to listen to Mendelssohn because I wrote a book, Listening to Mendelssohn. And that's what I did. I listened to Mendelssohn. And the difference, as I always say, is what happens when you keep on listening, because Mendelssohn was a tremendously great composer, and his music is fabulous, and it deserves to be paid attention to. It really, really, really does. And so I, I talked a little bit previously about, you know, major Mendelssohn cycles, complete cycles. I talked about the Litten on Biss and the Dohnani on Decca and and the, the Thomas Fai on Hensler, you know, all of which are excellent in their ways. And a couple of them we're going to mention again. But, you know, I wanted to do an ideal Mendelssohn cycle because each symphony deserves to be savored and treated that way, I think. And, and that will give us an opportunity to talk about singleton performances from people who didn't do complete cycles and also to consider each work a little bit uh, as an individual entity. So let's start with symphony number one, the one that nobody ever plays. I don't know why they never play it. My goodness, it's a wonderful, it's in C minor, it's a sort of Sturm und Drang updated Mozart symphony is what it is. And and not in a bad way. I mean, Mendelssohn knew his stuff. And when Mendelssohn had a model, he easily rose to the same quality most of the time. He really did. I mean, he was, he was a, a genius and he knew what he was doing. Now, the first symphony, when Mendelssohn even performed it, had its, its scherzo substituted with the orchestral version of the scherzo from the octet, because he thought that would make it more popular. But even as it stands, with all of its original movements intact, it is an absolutely wonderful, lively, exciting, really exciting. I mean, Mendelssohn's music is exciting piece. You know, one of the things people don't realize, you know, is that Mendelssohn... Mendelssohn, getting it ready here. Mendelssohn was a fast composer. You know, he really wrote in very quick tempos. His music has, everyone talks about, you know, he wrote, you know, fairy scherzos, lots of elfin, fantastical, magical kind of music that moves softly and very, very quickly. Well, that's true. But his loud music moves very, very quickly too. He just thought quickly musically. And so his, his, his pieces kind of fly along. They don't have dead spots. They really don't. And that's really true of the first symphony. It's exciting, very exciting. It's also extremely difficult to find separately. Usually it's only included in a complete set. 
And so I'm going to mention one that's in a complete set because you might as well get the complete set and then supplement with individual performances. Or, you know, however you want to do it is up to you, of course. There is um, a recording of Symphony Number no. 1 all by itself uh, that's come out recently with the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra um, under, under um, what's his name, Harris Casado or whatever his name is. Holy cow, it's an abomination. You know, it's with the second piano concerto. I, you just what those people are doing playing that music, I have no clue. So let us forget about that one. And let's just talk about great recordings of the first. And I'm going to start with Dohnani, because the Dohnani Vienna cycle is my recommendation for the first primal Mendelssohn cycle you should have. There are other excellent Mendelssohn cycles. I mean, Abato is very good, and the Litton is very good, and you know. But this one, this one, Dochnani Viennafil, it doesn't get much better than that. Plus, you get the Erste Walpurgisnacht and a bunch of overtures. It's really a nice, comes in a nice little box now. This was the old, when it came as two duos, but it's it's wonderful. And I really, really recommend that you hear it one way or another. Listen to the first symphony, and don't take it for granted. Just sit down on your but put it on, don't do anything else, and just listen. It's wonderful. You're going to love it, I guarantee. Well, now we get to the real sticking point. Number two, the Lobgesang, mm, which Mendelssohn called a symphony cantata. It's the song of praise. Boy, has this piece gotten trashed. I mean, nobody likes it. It's amazing. It's considered sort of the ultimate piece of Victorian, Victorian sentimental, you know, glop music. And I, and I really thought that way. I hated the thing. I hated it sight unheard. I hated it because of its reputation. And I was totally wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong. I thought it was this slow, triacly boring piece of garbage. It's First of all, it's Mendelssohn. It's not very slow. And it's anything but garbage. It's marvelous. It's beautifully shaped, perfectly paced. It has tons of internal contrast between the movements. What really actually turned my attention on when it came to this piece, what really woke me up to it, was a concert I saw with Mazur and the New York Philharmonic. And they didn't do the symphony at all. They played other stuff. I don't even remember what the other stuff was. What I remember is that the encore was the slow movement. It's just the Andante Religioso. It's like five or six minutes long. Mazur played it as an encore. It, everybody was like stunned. I mean, you know, you think they're going to do like a Hungarian dance or something as an encore. He played this piece. It was gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And not a single person there recognized it. No one knew what it was. And it was so beautiful, taken by itself. And it, 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 you know, I, I just couldn't believe it. That that's what it was. I mean, who would use a Mendelssohn slow movement as an encore? You know, some big noisy orchestral thing. It was marvelous, marvelous. So, what is the Lobgesang? So, the Lobgesang is a, a big introductory sonata allegro movement with contrapuntal elements, and the piece is in cyclical form because it's based on you know, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You know, I mean, I don't know exactly what I forget the Germans. It's like, ah, les, what, oh, de ma, lo, bet, hair, something like that, you know. And, and that's the main tune that comes back all the time. Then there's a scherzo like movement, and then that slow movement, and then a multi movement cantata finale with a couple of soloists and chorus. And it's broken up into little, like, three and four minute movements, like a song cycle almost. And they're beautiful. They're just beautiful. And it ends with a big, happy finale. The funny thing about it is that, you know, if you play it like, you know, for example, Carrion does with that heavy grandiosity, it can sound pretty sickly and sentimental. Now, some people love Carrion's version. And I mean, that's that's one approach that achieved a certain favor. Um, and it comes straight out of that sort of Victorian view of Mendelssohn, of Mendelssohn as somebody who was who was bigger than his britches. He tried to be, you know, that he didn't have it. But nowadays, when I hear performances of it, you know, it, I, I, I understand what I'm listening to, first of all. And second of all, um, I, I, I do think the approach needs to be 
in keeping with the scale of the music. Mendelssohn is not a bombastic composer. He's not a grandiose composer. He can be grand, but he's not grandiose, if you know what I mean. You know, he can be majestic, but he's never he's never a tub-thumping, pompous posturer. And he was a very, very sincere Lutheran, although he was born Jewish, of course, and all that stuff. Very sincere in his religious feeling. And, and he expresses it in this music quite beautifully. And there is a performance that I recommend very, very strongly. If you're just getting into Mendelssohn and you want to give the Lobka song a shot, aside from having Dachnadis in the complete cycle, which is also splendid, it really is. But a totally different character of the music is this one, Frieder Bernius on, on Carus. Now, Bernius has done the complete Mendelssohn sacred music for Carus. It's a wonderful, wonderful set. Um, beautiful performances, and anyone who's listened to Bernius's recordings on Carlos knows he's a wonderful choral conductor, wonderful in Baroque music. And in this particular piece, he's got, let's see, the Kammerchor Stuttgart, which is a crack ensemble of singers, and the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie Bremen, which is one of the great chamber orchestras in the universe. And they just blow this piece away. And I don't mean that in a noisy sense. I mean, in terms of sensitivity, phrasing, precision, balance, it's exquisite. It goes like the wind. You, it, it takes almost exactly the same amount of time, this piece, as Beethoven's Ninth. And it's often compared unfairly to Beethoven's Ninth, I think. It's a totally different piece. It really is. But a totally different kind of a piece, even though it may have had a model in Beethoven's Ninth. But as I said, when Mendelssohn picks a model, he always he always equals it in his own way. And he's not making the mistake of trying to imitate. He's doing something different. And in this particular case, I mean, in this performance, it's so fresh, so lively, so, so unsentimental. And I don't mean that by that inexpressive. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, not, it, it's not tacky ever, ever. And I want to play you a couple of excerpts because I have permission to do it. From Karos, thank you very much, Karos. This is such a splendid performance. It will change your whole view, not only of the work, but of Mendelssohn as a composer and as a composer of sacred music too. I want you to hear a bit of the second movement. It's an allegretto, un poco agitato. It's a little scherzo. You would be easily forgiven if you thought that this had been written by Tchaikovsky. Just listen to it. It has that so what am I talking about? We'll talk about it afterwards. Listen to it now. Just listen to this first bit of the second movement. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that just wonderful? Just listen to that tune. I mean, holy cow, what a great tune. And, and, and the orchestration and the pizzicato accompaniment, you know, it, and, and it's just a, a melancholy, soulful waltz tune with beautiful woodwind coloration and, you know, a, a, a tune that, that's harmonically impossible to pigeonhole. Is it major? Is it minor? Is it, it's pensive. It's, it's so marvelous. And it is absolutely the kind of thing that Tchaikovsky did later, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's incredible. And then, of course, we get to the vocal bits. And, you know, the big moment, you know, there, there's, there's a whole, you know, it's all, it's all about praise, basically. And, and there's a moment of darkness about, you know, I'm waiting for the, for the Lord to comfort me and visit and say hello and, you know, tell me how he's doing and whatnot. And, and then the Der Nacht or is it Die Nacht? It's German. I did, I've never heard of a language where you decline articles. It's just demented. It's grammatically twisted. It is. Die Nacht ist vergangen. That's why I was a German history major. <laughs> so I had to learn all that stuff. Die Nacht ist vergangen. Night is gone. And of course, it's a sunrise. And it's a sunrise 
it's again, it's all in proportion, especially in this performance. And the one thing you'll notice about Bernius is that he keeps the sunrise moving. It has rhythm and it has energy. It doesn't lay there like lead. Here, listen to the sunrise. <laughs> that can be if you don't strain for effect but play what Mendelssohn wrote in the way that Mendelssohn wrote it and keep it all keep it all uh, moving along smartly it's just wonderful so that is my choice Bernie as in case you haven't noticed for the second symphony for the Lobkasan and now we get to number three the Scottish which used to be called the Scotch but since scotch is, you know, a form of liquor, they figure you better call it Scottish now. It's the Scottish Symphony. Now, the Scottish Symphony, none of these pieces were written, were, were the numbers have nothing to do with the order in which they were written, by the way. Just so you know, because Mendelssohn never published four and five. The last one he did that we know of that he actually released was the third, the Scottish. And it is absolutely one of the most marvelous, colorful, and sophisticated pieces of music written before really the late, late, late 19th century. It's in an extraordinary type of cyclical form. The opening theme, uh, you know, it begins with da 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 yeah, It's a beautiful, beautiful tune, which becomes the theme of the Allegro in the first movement, it becomes the theme of the Scherzo. You know the Scherzo? You know, that's the same tune. If you listen to it carefully, the slow movement isn't related to anything else, but it's quite brief. And then the finale, which is, of course, a transformation in its second theme of the initial theme. And, and then there's a heroic apotheosis at the end. It's just a great symphony. It is so subtle and sophisticated in its thematic transformations. And again, it has no dead spots at all. It moves just beautifully. And the recording that I love, that I think is absolutely special and marvelous, and there are a lot of them, let's face it, there really are a lot of them. I mean, Dohnani did it twice. There's the famous Peter Mogg one on Decca, which I never liked as much as the English critics liked, but okay, people like it. There, there's, there's a zillion... Scottish symphonies, but my fave, Bernstein and the Israel Philharmonic. And it was my favorite because it was so unexpected. You know, it turns out, you know, Bernstein, just like he's a great Schumann conductor, he's also a great Mendelssohn conductor. You know, he's a great conductor. He really is just a great conductor. I mean, and and these performances, again, they have all that freshness and energy and and that that wonderful feeling of of romantic, romantic a effusion, you know, romantic, with that beautiful, beautiful emotionalism, but, but always with Mendelssohn, always tasteful. Mendelssohn was a tasteful guy. He was a gentleman. And if you like music that's down and dirty, I mean, you're not going to hear, you know, hear in his music, you know, Salome kissing the head of John the Baptist. That, that doesn't happen in Mendelssohn. And as I say in my book, just accept it and move on. If you don't want to hear music written by a gentleman, that's polite and that has a certain a certain level of 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 of, of comportment to it at all times. Don't listen to Mendelssohn. Don't waste your time, because that's part of who he was, and it's not a bad thing. Not all great music has to be disgusting. I mean, a lot of it does. I mean, Wagner, you know, incest and Die Valkyrie. That was exciting. We liked the incest, right? I mean, you know, music has that ability to make us like disgusting things. But Mendelssohn was not out to do that in his music. And you can't hold it against him. That's the thing. You can't tell somebody who has, takes great pride in always being a well-mannered gentleman that that's bad and that it's bad artistically, that it's bad aesthetically. 
And that the romantic movement had no place for that. It's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And Mendelssohn proves that it's nonsense. And he does it in the in the Scottish Symphony. So Bernstein, Israel Phil on DJ. A great, great performance. I know there are others. Next, the Italian Symphony. Oh, the Italian Symphony. Now, everyone loves the Italian Symphony. I never liked it much. I liked the outer movements. The two inner movements always struck me as insufficiently contrasted. You know, they just sort of lay there. But, and Mendelssohn, of course, wanted to revise it before he published it. He never got around to it. And John Elliott Garter recorded some revised bits of it or something. And it didn't matter because his performances are boring and not very interesting. But there are many, many great recordings of the Italian symphony. And the one I've chosen may surprise you. I hope it surprises you because it just goes to show that you have to keep on listening. My choice for the Italian symphony and it's a singleton version. That's the reason I chose it, is Claudio Abbado with the Berlin Philharmonic. First of all, you get a terrific Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream on the same disc. Second of all, it's a great Italian symphony. Now, he did it already, you know, for Deutsche Grammophon with the London Symphony, which is also a very, very fine performance. But this singleton release, I think, is just the best of the kind of conductor Abbado was. He was also a gentleman. He was very good doing Mendelssohn because his temperament, I think, really suited Mendelssohn's music. And this is an absolutely magnificently played and beautifully recorded version. Really, really lovely in all respects. I could have chosen Zell, but I didn't because some of you were probably out there saying, he's going to pick Zell, he's going to pick Zell, he's going to pick Zell. That's why I picked Abato because Zell's is great. Unbelievably great. His Midsummer Night's Dream music is great. But I think Abato deserves credit for his achievement in this respect. And it's a wonderful, wonderful Italian symphony in modern sound, which matters because Mendelssohn's orchestration is so brilliant and so colorful and lovely to hear that uh, the quality of the recording also matters quite a bit. And now we finally come to the last one, number five, the Reformation. Now, Mendelssohn didn't even like this symphony. He, he wrote it and then just disregarded it and said, oh, the hell with it again. You know, he wasn't going get, to get bothered by it. It's another piece that comes in for a lot of guff. First, because Mendelssohn didn't like it, but we, we, we don't need to take that seriously. We really don't. There are some composers who I think you, you have to take their opinion seriously, but there are others. Tchaikovsky was another. He hated everything he wrote as soon as he wrote it. Didn't want to hear from, didn't want to know from half of it. And it was marvelous. It was marvelous. And Mendelssohn was a very self-critical composer. You know, people think that because he was such a prodigy and he was so fluent that his music came easy. It didn't. And he actually was extremely reluctant to publish anything because that would make a permanent statement. And he didn't want to make a permanent statement. He wanted to tinker and revise. And, you know, he was like Mahler. You know, nothing was ever the same way twice. And so he never got around to doing anything with the Reformation Symphony. And probably the whole occasion on which it was performed was distasteful to him because it was celebrating you know, the one of the, you know, the, the diet of worms or something reformational. And, and, you know, here he was, the fact that he was Jewish, racially Jewish, was always an issue. And he got trashed by the press with uh, probably had some anti-Semitic leanings behind it. Um, the work was not well received. And that's a pity because it's a very, very beautiful work. It has, you know, this the Dresden Amen in it, just like the bit for the opening of Parsifal. And I think Wagner definitely knew his Reformation Symphony. When you listen to the opening, and you'll you'll realize that. It's an absolutely wonderful work. It's beautiful. First note to last, the chorales, you know, it uses, you know, a mighty fortress is our God, you know, da 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 no, I can't even do that. My voice is shot. It's great. It's it's just great and lovely to listen to. And if it isn't his greatest symphony, it's certainly not a bad piece of music. And the performance I have chosen makes it sound like a great piece of music. And that is Charles Munch with the Boston Symphony. Now he did Mendelssohn 345 and he was a great, great Mendelssohn conductor. Let us not forget that Munch was from Alsace. He was born in Strasbourg or in those regions. He was quasi-German from the start, quasi-Lutheran from the start. Maybe he was Lutheran. I don't even know. But I, I mean, he was very friendly with like Albert Schweitzer. I mean, he he got his, 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 his 
first big position as a musician, or he was concertmaster and at the Leipzig Gavant House. I mean, he, he played in, in the Gavant House for many, many years. And, and, you know, he had the Mendelssohn tradition in his bones. He really did. It's a great Mendelssohn fifth. Again, it's another one of those performances where sit down, just listen, and let it let it wash over you and engage it with the music. You will not realize what you've been missing. I, I guarantee it. I mean, it really is, music is that way. It, it has substance. What it needs is your attention, but it has the substance. And and that's the point I want to make in this, in this series of ideal Mendelssohn performances. Now, some of you may have your own. I would be more than happy, more than happy to see your lists. I mean, there are some really fine individual discs out there. Schulte's three and four are terrific. I mean, you know, people who think I dog Schulte is Mendelssohn three and four. No way. Absolutely first rate. Many, many fine performances. And I really hope that you'll take a chance to sit back and, and listen to one, two, and five, in addition to three and four, and give them a chance. That's all they need. And why wouldn't you want to? I mean, it's not like it's not like there there's so much great music by great composers out there that we don't pay attention to. I mean, and here's this great composer who wrote five symphonies, three of which we basically don't pay attention to. I find that astonishing. I find that astonishing. So let us write this horrifying injustice. And you can do it simply if you keep on listening. Thank you so much. Take care.